Welcome to the 2021 Tennessee State Lectureship. We're thankful and we're honored that you have tuned in to this year's lectureship. My name is Samuel Jones, and I serve as the Family Life Minister for the East Jackson Church of Christ. We're honored to host the lectureship this year. We are thankful for the steering committee for planning and organizing this spiritual feast. The theme for this year's lectureship is help. Help healing for everyday life's problems. On this morning, we have three, lecture, uh, three workshops that are scheduled for your spiritual enrichment. Workshop number one, entitled Conviction While Facing Eviction. Workshop number two, entitled The Hurt of the Vision the healing in unity. And then we have workshops for men and workshop for women. The for men is entitled How a Man Heals, and for the women, the workshop is entitled How a Woman Heals. We're thankful uh, for these workshops and we're praying that they will be informative and spiritually enriching. We need your head. Hello, I'm Robert Gardenhire, minister of the Schrader Lane Church of Christ. I'm happy to be participating in this 2021 Tennessee State Lectureship. I've been asked to share with you regarding the topic of conviction while facing eviction. There are three things that I would like to share with you in this discussion. First is faith, calling upon God. The second has to do with practical insights, things that we may be able to do in dire straits. And third, I'll share, especially with those of you who are church leaders, some practical things that you can do in the church to not only bolster the strength of the church and its ministries, but also the communities surrounding. Let's begin with faith and calling upon God. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we have a great example of faith in the life of a poor woman who found herself without the resources that would be needed to keep her family intact. Doesn't that sound familiar? 
Her circumstance was that her husband had died, she had two sons, no money, and no other resources, no one upon whom to call. Now there was a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take him, my two sons, to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Here I want to emphasize that this woman had the presence of mind to call upon the man of God. By doing so, she was actually calling upon God. Why was she willing to call upon God? Well, it's insightful to see that she was the wife of a son of a prophet. She was familiar with the things and the ways of God because of her relationship to the sons of the prophet. She called upon God, and you and I today can have the same kind of conviction that she had in the face of eviction or other dire circumstances. How do we call upon God? Well, one way that we can all call upon God is through prayer. Yes, prayer. We have a great example in Matthew chapter 17 of the importance of prayer in tough circumstances. Jesus' disciples had been approached by a man who had demons. He was, in fact, a lunatic. And they had tried to exorcise these demons from him such that he would become civil. But they were unable to do so. When Jesus came upon the scene, he removed the demon. And much to the amazement of his disciples, they asked Jesus why they had not been able to do that. After all, they had been empowered with miracles prior to this. And Jesus said, this is the kind that comes only with prayer and fasting. You and I can take a note from Jesus there and know that in the most difficult circumstances, just as this poor widow did, we should call upon God. And I believe that this example given to us by the widow is something that each one of us should begin with when we face our trials, our troubles, and our uncertainties that are certain to come our way. And that again is call upon God. Calling upon God requires faith. In that same 17th chapter of Matthew, Jesus concluded his answer to his disciples by saying that if you have faith as large as a grain of mustard seed, you will be able to remove mountains. What was he saying? After all, a grain of mustard seed is a small thing. Was he saying that you should have small faith? I don't think so. I believe Jesus was teaching that we should have big faith even in small things. And the result of that would be that God will move mountains as it were for us. So I say again that the first thing we must do to have conviction is have the willingness to call upon God. And if I have the conviction that's necessary to call upon God, I will have even greater conviction and increased faith. May God help us all to increase our faith so that we will have conviction while facing eviction. In addition to calling upon God out of faith and doing things that we can prayerfully through faith, we also have the concept of facing our obstacles by making use of what we have. In the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, Elisha said to the woman, What shall I do for thee? Tell me 
what hast thou in the house? And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Thank God that she had a pot of oil. It may have seemed as though it was one little pot, but great things were going to happen as a result of that. And I want to always be mindful that when we're facing trials, obstacles, when we are against seemingly insurmountable circumstances, we must pause to consider what we have. For example, we have physical resources. If we are financially strapped, we may consider the use of savings that otherwise would have been off limit. We may consider unused items that we can sell such that our resources can be extended. We also may think about getting rid of things that are too expensive. I'll give you examples. Cable television sometimes can be more than it's worth, particularly when we're having insufficient funds to eat. Expensive mobile phone contracts and agreements may be something that can be reduced in cost for simpler situations. I believe that in addition to seeking lower cost, if our burden is financial, that we also can look for skills that we have. Remember the question to this woman was, what do you have in the house? Many times we have skills that have gone unused or unrealized. I'll give you the example of a young man I know who worked for seven years for a very popular and well-known company. And by doing so, he saved his money year after year, but eventually found himself in a circumstance where he no longer wanted to have that job. So rather than being in desperation, he fell back on skills that he had obtained. Today, that young man is self-employed. He does investing as brokerage and day trading. And he also has qualified himself as a real estate agent. So the suggestion I'm making to us is when we find ourselves in tough situations, think about what we have in the house, what resources we have, what skills we have. And then, especially for churches, and this applies to us as individuals as well, when we think about what we have in the house, do not hesitate to use it. I recall when the great tornado of Nashville came through about two years ago that the North Nashville area was devastated. Here at the Schrader Lane Church of Christ, by the second day after the tornado, we had established a relief center on the church campus. We had not time to gather large amounts of resources by which people would be relieved, but we began anyway. And God has a way of taking what we have and multiplying it. In the case of this woman, he told her to borrow from her neighbor and have lots of jars, if you will, or pots, as they're called in some translations of the scripture, and fill them with oil. And the more pots she received, the more oil she filled. God caused her oil not to be depleted. When we were on this church campus and people were coming by in large numbers to receive supplies of food, personal hygiene items, clothing, we didn't run out because neighboring churches also heard about the fact that we were here and they brought goods and items. 
the community responded beyond the church by sending people to assist, we in fact received more help in that circumstance than we actually needed. So I'm saying use the resources that you have and count on God. I want to give you another example of that. During the pandemic in the year 2020, we had eight food drives. Those food drives were essential, particularly to two poor schools in the neighborhood. Those children had been accustomed to meals that were served at school. Schools were closed. And in many cases, the families didn't have sufficient meals to feed them in a healthy way. So our food drives were very important. As we announced our food drive to the congregation, also knowing that we were streaming our services, what we failed to realize was who was listening to our streaming. There was a couple who lived north of Indianapolis, yes, up in Indiana, who heard about our food drives, and each time that we had a food drive, they came all the way from Indiana, often with a van weighted down with food. And we always had plenty of food to give. This reminds me of the passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that God has a way of multiplying our resources. So I want to say to you, when you face difficult odds and seemingly insurmountable circumstances, be sure to use what you have and allow God to cause those resources to be extended. Finally, I'd like to share with those of you who are church leaders just some suggestions and observations as to how you can help your congregation to continue strong in the present day circumstances and even in difficult circumstances that surely are to come. One of the things that we have been blessed to do here at the Schrader Lane Church of Christ is to make the necessary adjustments such that we can continue strongly and in fact expand our outreach during this pandemic period. So I'll begin by saying number one is to have a plan in place. And by that, I mean a plan as to how you will communicate with people in disasters, even earthquakes, floods, any type of disaster. But that plan will help you regardless of the circumstance. We were able, because we had already put in place a concept of being a well-connected church, and doing so with our 17 zones, we had people in place who would communicate with various members within their geographical area. So that meant that as leaders, rather than contacting 1,300 people, we were able to begin with 17 zone leaders who within their zones would be able to get the word out. On the first day that we chose to suspend our worship service, we made that choice just three days, or frankly, just two days before that date. We made the choice on a Friday that we would not worship physically on the following Sunday. The word got out because of the structure that was already in place, and there were only five people who came to church that morning, just five who did not get the word. So have a plan in place. With that plan, I suggest that you have specific details dealing with key aspects of the operation. For example, plans for conducting worship plans for conducting Bible studies, plans for communicating with those who work 
in our ministries and our ancillary services? How do you express to them the expectations? Fortunately, our pre-established structures aided us in all of that. When we made those choices and began to use that structure, communication was vital not only to those 17 zone leaders, but to the leaders within the church, our 14 deacons, our nine elders, our four ministers, all had to hear and see the same thing so that they could be active in spreading the same word to members who would contact them. In addition to having a plan, know that there are programs in place that every church must be aware of. Yes, this pandemic caught all of us off guard, but there are grants for example, for ongoing of certain vital ministries that serve the community, if you have such. Those grants can be acquired at practically any time with the proper information. In addition to grants, there is also something that's vital, which is the church's ability to supplement the work that must go on, even in a pandemic. We were able to pivot our budget. And by pivot, I mean, instead of fully budgeting 52 ministries as we had in the past, we restructured our budget such that some of our non-essential ministries would receive less and our ministries that would be benevolent, expecting that people would have greater needs, these benevolent ministries would have more. And that enabled us to serve people in a powerful way. In addition to pivoting our budget, one of the things that we have to keep in mind in unusual circumstances as church leaders is the well-being of those who serve the church. We have a, an assisted living center with a staff of several employees. We have two childcare centers that are staffed with teachers, teachers aides, and administrative assistants. And we have a Christian community services entity that assists those who are striving to advance beyond public housing, those who need assistance in their educational pursuits, and those whose children and families need tutoring such that collectively all of these services will help the family gain and advance and eventually reach economic independence. To do this well in unusual times, we began to supplement certain ministries because we cared first for those employees who worked in those ministries. They were accustomed to paychecks and modest, although those paychecks were, they were still important for those families' livelihood. So the elders of the church made a commitment early on to supplement the wages and salaries of our people who were displaced because of the pandemic. Some of our services in our child care center were not needed because of disbanding those functions for a period of time or downsizing because of the smaller number of children who would be served. But our people who had worked and served diligently still needed their livelihoods. And it was important that the church, while our members and employees were facing circumstances as dire as conviction, it was important that the church did not turn its back on them. So I suggest to you today, as church leaders, in summary, 
have a plan. Make sure that the plan is well communicated among key leaders and those who can exercise the plan. And by the way, be sure to review the plan frequently to make necessary adjustments. And review the plan to make sure that it's actually being executed as planned. And then take advantage of financial resources such as grants. Care for the staff so that they will care for the ministry. Supplement the ministries with accent and emphasis on those that are essential in times like these. And make sure that the budget for the church and for those entities is scrutinized carefully so that it can be pivoted to be aligned with the times in which we live. In our discussion today, we've discussed three things. One is calling upon God and doing so in faith. And when we call upon God with faith, we're certain to increase our conviction even in the face of eviction and other circumstances. Second, we've talked about practical insights. Practical insights have to do with those things which we can do. In our scripture from 2 Kings chapter 4, we saw that the woman used what she had. She had one jar of oil. And the insights that we have today allow us to use the things that God has given us, the resources that we have, the skills that we have. And as a result of that, not only will our conviction be increased, but God will allow us to avoid eviction type circumstances, those things that are detrimental to us. And then finally, we made some observations especially for church leaders, about the things that the church can do in the face of unusual circumstances. We can, in fact, pivot our budget to apply it to the things that are most important. We must take care of those who work and are receiving pay in our ministries such that they will be sustained. And we must also adjust our budgets in order to be benevolent as opposed to business as usual. We must use the resources that we have knowing that God will benefit us by having the community to supplement that which we're doing as necessary. May God bless us, may God keep us, and in every circumstance of our lives, my prayer is that God will have us to have great conviction in the face of eviction. Good afternoon. Again, I am Brother Lavelle Hayes, a minister of the East Jackson Church of Christ, who is your host minister for this Tennessee State Lectureship. We've got a lot going on in our days, and sometimes we are ignored within the Lord's body. But not so today. We have two very capable, kind-hearted, scripturally-based brethren that are going to share with us some things under the overall thought, the hurt of division, the healing of unity. We have Brother Charles Taylor, who is a minister of the Front Street Church of Christ in Milan, Tennessee, and Brother Brent Smith, the minister of the Trenton Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee. Both of these brethren I know of as fine brethren and brethren who I have fellowship with. So they're going to uh, ask us to consider, to think about some things on this, on this topic in three separate short presentations. The first one, under our theme, the hurt of division, the healing of unity, Brother Taylor is going to share a word about the obstacles of the present, and Brother Smith is going to share some things about opportunities that these times present. So let's listen with open ears and open minds as God blesses us through this session. 
I'm pleased to be able to play a part in the lectureship and to be a part of this session. Uh, all of us know that there's some things that we sometimes are uncomfortable with dealing with, but nevertheless, this is one that needs to be dealt with, and today we'll have an opportunity to get some thoughts flowing. Uh, the obstacles of the present. Uh, we understand that because we're in the world, even though we're not of the world, that's what's going on around us affect uh, our ability to accomplish certain things and certain goals. And so we understand with the virus out there, that is one of the present things that can play a part uh, in how we behave and the things we do or not do. One of the obstacles is the cultural changes that are taking place around us uh, socially, uh, the environment that we're living in. We understand that there's a number of things that uh, the media is hyping up and, and sometimes even, uh, I think, getting exaggerating certain things, but some of these problems have been uh, around. The idea of trying to have unity and what hinders us from having that kind of unity. Uh, we understand that there are sometimes individuals who uh, have a problem with gender situations, and uh, we know that the Lord's Church is being plagued to some extent by this, by those who are saying, you know, society is saying that let women play a bigger part, and we want to do that and that kind of thing. We know that racial issues have always uh, been around, and I suppose will always be. Uh, sometimes we need to understand it's not just between uh, Afro-Americans and, and the Caucasians and their other races as well. All of us need to treat each other uh, with the respect that God wants us to have. And so some of the things that's hindering us is the cultural environment in which we live, um, the pressures that are put on by those around us in uh, society. Uh, Sometimes individuals, if the pressures of society wasn't there, they may would behave differently. And I've had some personal experience uh, in a congregation down south where there was a split in the pressures from the outside cause uh, some misbehavior of some that were members. And so we need to understand that that's a present thing now, the pressures. We understand also that one of the things that's bothering us is uh, the, you might say, losing identity to some extent in the church because as the political uh, climate changes around and individuals are saying, I'm this, I'm, I'm, on, I'm part of this party and that party, how can you be a part of that party? And they handle this and they deal with that. And so I, I you know, I, I, I find myself identifying with a certain political party. I'm independent, I'm this, I'm that, and so forth. Uh, sometimes I believe that is a hindrance. We don't sometimes want to admit it, but it seems to me that it is, to some extent, uh, sometimes a problem. We have heard the term uh, Christian nationalism, and I think this, what I'm talking about, would fit in that category uh, because of what's going on in the nation. We kind of somewhat take sides, and that can get in the way of us feeling comfortable uh, with one another. And of course, we know uh, God doesn't uh, uh, recommend certain uh, political parties and so forth, and of course, it's a struggle for some. If this party supports this, I'm support that, which way should I go? <clears throat> Sometimes there's problem within. We also know that because of the climate around us environmentally, that there are those who are uh, rejecting some of the biblical teachings and principles to try to feel comfortable with those that are not part of the body. And I think that's uh, somewhat of a problem also that we face. Uh, one of the things that we know that has a little bit of a problem, at least some, is with the virus that's out there, social distancing, and not feeling comfortable sometime with each other, and even wondering how to greet one another sometime, uh, whether to get close, bump elbows, fists, whatever the case, all of that makes you a little bit uneasy, and uh, I think everybody's feeling a little bit of that in the particular setting that we're in. Uh, one of the things that bothers me is the media and so forth is bringing up a lot of past hurts and injustices and so forth and pushing that forward as if we have not made any progress. And of course we know that that's not the case. Uh, but sometime if you're not careful, I believe it's gonna cause uh, people to be oversensitive toward one another, afraid to say what need to be said, afraid the way we say it, the terms we may use, 
all of this, as we know, the media is hyping this kind of thing. And so we understand then that this can be a problem. And I guess all of us are kind of being cautious in the way we communicate and so forth and relate to uh, each other and so forth. I believe that the mistakes of the past were mistakes of the past. Uh, all of us are individuals who maybe feel comfortable in certain situations or certain subject matter. Uh, and so there are some that we're not comfortable with. And so we have to sometime begin to try to rethink how we ought to view each other uh, as Christians. We ought to be able to handle some of these things much better than those in the world. And so, uh, in fact, is uh, we've seen some uh, efforts being put forth. In fact, there in, in Milan, the two congregations across town, we, we decided we're going to have some, we're going to come over uh, one of your services and you come over with ours and going to do some of that. Uh, we're at the point where most people are comfortable with doing that. And of course, the virus set in. And uh, I mentioned to them where well, we came over and the virus hit before, so y'all owe us when the virus lets up. Anyway, but we're seeing that individuals' attitudes are changing and we must not allow past hurts, injustices, and so forth um, to become a, a barrier so that we'll say, well, we're not really gonna be welcomed. And so, you know, I don't want to uh, try to get any closer and so forth. Um, uh, on the other side, it may be that we're, you know, they're going to feel like we're looking down and on them. And so all these attitudes that we have that wondering how the other's going to be, I think that uh, is uh, somewhat of a problem. And so let's, we got to keep that in mind. We generally try to assume how this person's feeling. And if I do this, I say that. And sometimes we're too sensitive sometimes maybe to just say some stuff that need to be said the way it ought to be said. And I'm going to stop right here and uh, uh, give uh, Brent an opportunity. I am grateful to be on this Tennessee State Lectureship, and I'm grateful to Brother Hayes for the invitation to be here, and I'm thankful to be here with you, Brother Taylor. I'm thankful for the years that we've known each other and worked together and been friends. Opportunities these times present. <clears throat> it is true, as you laid out, that we have troubles around us, troubles in our communities and society, but I do believe what Paul said in Romans 8 28 that God can work all things together for good to those that love him and we love him and I believe that he can help us uh, to do good things with the hand that we've been dealt in Galatians chapter 2 I believe Peter was doing a good thing he was eating with Gentiles at Antioch I've always wondered if those Gentiles with whom he was eating if they were Christians or non-Christians. I wonder if he was making an evangelistic effort on that occasion. But then, of course, Jewish Christians came from James, and he played the hypocrite, and Paul called him out on that. Peter had a great opportunity to do something very powerful and very good in demonstrating to the community at that time that Christ had brought reconciliation to Jews and Gentiles. Of course, he squandered that opportunity, at least for the moment. But then the Apostle Paul took um, an obstacle, if you will, and he made something good. God, God did something good uh, through Paul with that obstacle in that Paul withstood Peter, and it gave P uh, Paul an opportunity to show that Christ had brought down that, that barrier between Jew and Gentile. So while there is so much tension and division, we have an opportunity for God to work through us to, uh, as God's people, do something really good. We have the opportunity to be seen together as we are being seen together now, um, being friendly with each other, talking with each other, even about a difficult subject. And we have an opportunity um, in the church to be seen worshiping together, fellowshipping with each other, um, working together in the community, um, um, taking uh, part in evangelistic efforts together and in benevolent efforts together, helping to heal uh, the hurts of, of society, working side by side. We just have so many opportunities to do that. And um, uh, by the way, Brother Taylor, I've been with the Trenton Church of Christ for about 18 years now, and you've been at Milan for how long? 33. 
33 years. And in all this time, you've never once asked me to lunch. <laughs> of course, the answer to that is I've never asked you to lunch either. We've, we've fellowshiped with each other, but we, uh, even on an individual basis, I could do a much better job at uh, reaching out to you and, and we could be seen working together uh, side by side in the community. Um, we have so much in common, and I think that that should be a focus. We have so much more in common than we differ. We, we love Jesus, we love the Lord's church, we love all people, and we want all people to be washed by the blood of Jesus and go to heaven, and we share the same morality, we believe in the same God and in the same Bible, and so um, in focusing on our similarities and, and the great things that we have in common, I think by doing that, we have great opportunities, um, even though we're surrounded by obstacles. Thank you, brethren, for those insights in that area. Now, we're going to change the focus just a little bit. Uh, under this theme, the hurt of division, the healing of unity. Uh, Brother Taylor is going to say a word about troubles with differences. And Brother Smith is going to say a word about tolerating our differences. Let's hear what insights they have to share with us. Appreciate uh, Brother Brent and the part he has uh, shared with us. And, and certainly uh, he points out some good things that this uh, present environment presents to us as the world needs to see that we uh, don't have a problem being with each other and so forth and that's a, a, a great opportunity and you can see what Christianity looks like uh, when it's uh, put into practice. Uh, the next part uh, that I will deal with is dealing with the troubles with differences, the trouble with differences. Uh, one of the things we know just from living and it's a human nature thing to uh, have a problem with differences and uh, even resisting change, even if the change is for the better. Um, it takes a little bit of time emotionally and so forth, attitude-wise, to make adjustments. Uh, I've talked to individuals who sometimes want to press issues, uh, press someone to do something quickly. I, I said that I've heard a saying that a person persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. It takes a little time to make the mental adjustment. I, I kind of think of Apostle Paul once he discovered that he was fighting against God's will, against Christianity, that there was a period of time where he seemed was went off by himself to some extent. And I can imagine uh, he had some internal work to do. And uh, so we, we understand that one of the things that human nature is that we have a problem sometime with changing and viewing ourselves in a different light. And so uh, that's one of the things about uh, differences that I understand. Uh, we come to, uh, when you think of things, some changes uh, should be made and some maybe shouldn't be ch made. One of the good things about having some resistance to change is uh, you can resist maybe doing something unscriptural uh, because you resist enough to take time to examine it and see if it fits the principles and teachings of the Bible. So that ability in us is good that we are not ready to just change all of a sudden because it may be a change for the worse. And so that's a good side of this resistance to change. Of course, the other side of resistance to change, if you're in the wrong, uh, then that we shouldn't put up as much resistance, but the fact that we are comfortable with certain things uh, make it seem like it's right just because it feels right. Uh, traditions uh, uh, versus the Bible is something that we have to realize is there. Uh, when we look at what the Bible teaches and sometimes we find maybe this congregation has traditions it's not wrong, but you're not accustomed to that. And so you might have a problem uh, being kind of isolating from that individual or that congregation or whatever, because that's not what you've been accustomed to. You've been a, traditionally, this is the way you've done it. But just because someone doesn't do some things where we have flexibility in doing them the way that we're accustomed to doing them doesn't mean that it's wrong. And But sometimes people won't even try to get to know 
uh, what you're doing and get someone an opportunity to, to answer, you're doing this, is, is that right? They just immediately just say, that's done differently. I've had members sometime to come and say, I went to the congregation and, and uh, they, they took the Lord's Supper before they, they did the sermon and, and, uh, and so forth. And because of that, they said, well, was, was that all right? And so sometimes you have individuals resisting uh, getting close to, to other individuals or congregations uh, because of some things that has to do with our traditional way of doing things and the way we see things. Um, even now in the present climate we're in, there are those sometimes who seem they're upset when they, do, when they find a congregation that say, look, we're just doing one service on Sunday and one on Wednesday night over the case. They seem to think, uh, I've heard some say, well, God, I'm not pleased when we're uh, dismissing some services and so forth. We're supposed to trust God and so forth. And um, I've had, I think, a letter sent uh, almost saying, you know, we, do, we don't need to be doing all this um, that's being t going on in communities and in, in our culture now about all this um, quarantining and stuff uh, is doing as much as uh, some congregations are doing because we also know that God expects us to use our, our common sense and God's not going to do everything for us. And of course, we know from the scriptures that uh, physicians were used. And uh, even Paul gave Timothy some advice about his taking care of his stomach. You, you drink something for stomach's sake and so forth. So we, it's not wrong to listen to what we know is true science and uh, govern ourselves accordingly. Uh, in fact, if the doctors, uh, you had a health issue and you knew certain things would hurt you. And uh, uh, I think you ought to listen to what the doctor says about leaving it alone and be a matter of judgment, but still uh, we have to be aware that there are some in this climate who uh, uh, have the idea, you know, uh, we, can keep, we can do all of our services and so forth and because we need to consider individuals. And there are those, and all of us are concerned about uh, the fact that uh, some uh, when to go virtual and, and worship at the house uh, rather than coming to assemblies and of course that's going to be something we could be dealing with as time goes along but the uh, differences often bring out some things um, language that are used sometimes the way we refer to certain things um, uh, sometimes cause a person to kind of draw back from uh, being closeness but sometimes terminologies and uh, all of us uh, have to deal with this kind of thing. We hopefully we're not doing this in congregations in a big in a bad in a big way. Is using terminologies uh, like uh, you you uh, are you liberal? Are you conservative? Uh, and because we do know when it comes to doctrinal issues that we use these terms for a reason. Uh, but we I don't think we ought to be whipping each other up using those terms like, you know, yeah, we gotta, I don't have nothing to do, they, they're too liberal and so forth. Um, I think, and there may be cases where after maybe some discussion uh, about why certain things are done and they have a problem with this kind of thing that maybe we do need to make, make it known that there's a reason why we can't get too close maybe to this congregation or uh, so forth. Uh, differences does uh, cause some distances. Uh, sometime even differences in what is called considered acceptable dress sometime and I've, I've gone to congregations where uh, no one well maybe one or two people had shirt and uh, dress shirt and tie and <clears throat> maybe dressed in blue jeans and t-shirts and so forth and uh, of course my first thought is whoa and then when the, the minister he, you know he didn't have on a tie and so forth uh, dress shirt <clears throat> Uh, took me a minute to mentally adjust uh, and uh, I had to realize that God doesn't, he doesn't designate on dress. There's some, I think maybe some matters of us wise or not wise principles and so forth may come into play. But even things like that uh, can cause a person to kind of draw back because they don't, you know, they don't dress, uh, I don't think, uh, dressy enough. And so, but that doesn't mean that it don't speak to their spirituality. It just may speak to the, the um, choices they made as about what kind of standards we're going to ask people to work toward or, or dress toward. And there's some things there. Stress sometimes is, is caused when we find that differences. We don't feel at ease with one another. And uh, 
uh, as human beings, we just, you know, we have, a, you know, Romans chapter 14. Uh, it says uh, when individuals obey the gospel, don't bring them in and, and start uh, debating about food issues, <laughs> uh, what you eat and so forth, and special days and so forth. And so sometimes these kind of things, I've had individuals say, I don't, I don't believe in having uh, appreciations for uh, ministers or whatever. Uh, and if you do, you need to be on a certain day and in a certain way and all this little things like this sometimes can cause us not to work at being as close as we need to be. But we need to watch, uh, watch this and not allow that to cause us to isolate ourselves from individuals who do things somewhat differently uh, than we do. I really like my assigned topic this time, tolerating our differences. The Eastside Church of Christ in Trenton is a predominantly African-American congregation with some white members, and where I preach at the Trenton Church of Christ, it is predominantly a Caucasian church with a few African-American members. And several years ago, we wanted to build up our uh, time spent together and our fellowship, and so we decided that each time uh, a congregation was having a gospel meeting, then for the Sunday afternoon service, we would um, cancel our services at our home congregation, and our whole church would go and meet with the other. East Side would come and meet with us when we were having a meeting. We would go meet with East Side when they were having a meeting, and uh, we have really enjoyed that and been blessed by that. And as you mentioned, that's kind of been uh, uh, done away with for the last year and a half because of the pandemic. But I remember the first time we did that, the first time we went to East Side, um, I noticed that um, all of the visiting African American preachers there were sitting up on stage. And uh, I didn't know what to do. And so I'm already kind of nervous about being on stage anyway. I'm nervous being here with you right now, as a matter of fact. But I didn't know what to do, and uh, I wanted to just sit with my family, but I didn't want to stand out like a sore thumb. So uh, I asked Brother Lawrence, L.B. Lawrence, who is the a very good gospel preacher there at Eastside, I said, where do I sit? And he said, Brother, you can sit anywhere you want to sit. And I said, thank you. And so I sat with my family. Well, all this time, and that's happened again and again, um, I don't know if I've been breaking tradition. I don't know if I should have been up on stage, uh, but I do know that uh, they haven't made me feel that way. They've been gracious and merciful towards me, and uh, they have tolerated me, which I'm glad because folks have been tolerating me for a long time, and if they didn't, I'd be in trouble. And But uh, those are the kinds of things, you know, that we, we just have to um, work through them and and not let the potential um, of of a of, of a difference keep us from trying to work together and sometimes that we may be tempted to do that um, there's a, a denominational missionary by the name of David Ireland and I heard a story about a, an occasion where he went to Germany and he took a friend with him from New Jersey well, they got to Germany, and a German, a bilingual German, came up and asked David Ireland's friend, um, where are you from? And he said, Hackensack. And the German said, where is Hackensack? And his friend said, close to the Washington Bridge. So David took his friend aside, and he said, uh, listen, there are lots of folks in New Jersey who don't know where Hackensack is, and there are a lot of Germans who don't know where New Jersey is. You're going to have to broaden your mind a little bit. And um, I think the more we broaden our minds and realize how big this world is, then the differences that we come across when we interact with each other are going to mean less and less. Um, tolerating our differences, some of those differences are so, um, there's no reason why they should ever pose a conflict. Um, we have funeral meals for um, uh, 
members at church when they've lost a loved one and of course that's been going on I guess for decades if not hundreds of years but uh, not long ago one of our African American members lost a dear member of their family and and so this sweet sister called me on the phone and she said can we have the repast at the building at the church building and I said sure and then after I hung up the phone with her the first thing I did is call one of our African-American members who's a deacon and said what is a repast <laughs> I had no idea but he said well that's a meal we have for the family well that we've been doing that I just didn't know what it was but um, to say that you know I mean that's really not a difference and to say that um, white funerals are different from black funerals or black funerals are different from white funerals um, I've been to funerals in in Mississippi and Georgia and all over Tennessee and funerals are different for everybody everywhere um, I guess it was maybe 15 years ago I was asked to do a graveside service for a, a white young man in the community who had died he was not a member of the church his family they weren't Christians and so I showed up at the graveside it's out in the country and their cars parked all over the cemetery with their radios blaring out loud music and everybody has a beer in their hand and you know that was well I mean that's not the kind of funeral I'm used to uh, to, so to say that all white funerals are the same every everywhere you go things are different um, not long ago one of uh, one of our church members um, a, a white uh, lady her her husband died and uh, at the funeral at the funeral home uh, one of the daughters was talking on the phone for a good part of it and then she came up to the mic she wanted to say a few words or so I thought she came up to the mic to talk well she had her brother on the phone who was in jail and he proceeded to use every every ugly word uh, imaginable so uh, you, you come across all kinds of things out, out in the world that are so uh, uh, different from maybe than you are used to our differences as brothers and sisters in Christ in the church uh, uh, are so insignificant in comparison to what we have in common and so we have to broaden we have to broaden our minds a little bit and uh, and see see the world a little differently I think um, I want to read Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 where Paul says be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another um, when we do that then tolerating our differences won't be a problem at all I think once again I, I appreciate you uh, one more thing that we want you to give attention to as we talk about this theme the hurting the hurt of division, the healing of unity. Brother Taylor is going to say a word about the hurt of division. And Brother Smith is going to say a word about the healing of unity. Let's hear what they have to share with us. I have to voice appreciation for the things that were said by Brother Brent. Um, it certainly, again, reminds us that as human beings, we have these, uh, these tendencies and we are going to run into things that uh, sometimes we're uncomfortable with, sometimes uh, we will um, have to remind ourselves uh, at the congregation where I preach I often point out that we as human beings, we're very complex beings and it's some, I don't understand really how God can tolerate us. <laughs> the fact that we have all these emotions and we feel this way and feel that way and, and then we have to work on trying to bring our attitudes and feelings uh, into uh, a, a position or setting that's pleasing to God <clears throat> so if God can uh, tolerate us <laughs> we need to learn to tolerate each other uh, hurts of division uh, all of us are aware that in the scriptures we find that there were even Jesus of the ones that he chose to be his apostles uh, they had some differences among them and how they looked at things and uh, and so we know uh, 
that uh, these uh, divisions and things can hurt. Uh, one of the things uh, hurts that come from uh, division is uh, throwing a negative light on the Lord's church and on Christ himself. Most of us have heard individuals when they see a Christian uh, act up saying, uh, if that's a Christian, then I don't want to be one. <laughs> Um, so we in the Lord's church, if we're going to teach that we're going to live by the scriptures, then we ought to make sure that we are taking this matter of relationships seriously, uh, because if we're not handling it the way it ought to be handled, it'll shed a negative light on Christ himself. Uh, is he really worthy to be followed? Uh, is it possible to follow him? It'll throw a negative light on the church, uh, for we uh, encourage individuals uh, to speak what the Bible speak, be silent with the Bible, to silent, do Bible things in Bible ways, called Bible things by Bible names. And so one of the things the Bible teaches, we're supposed to love one another. Not only love uh, as brethren, but we're even supposed to love our enemies, which means we're going to try to treat them the way uh, we want to be treated. And so if we're not uh, working on uh, getting rid of division, and if division is uh, a uh, ugly head that's showing itself uh, uh, in the fellowship, then we are sh showing a negative light on Christianity, on Christ, and even on the Bible. Uh, for that's one of the things the Bible uh, teaches that we are supposed to treat each other like uh, neighbors. We understand that uh, division can hurt evangelism. Uh, often there are good works that could be accomplished if we could get uh, a number of congregations that's willing to work together on some things. And uh, certainly uh, I've noticed that in some religious organizations, they, they seem like they make it a, uh, their business to have uh, paired up uh, black and white visiting in the community and so forth. Um, and that shows you know that they're trying to be what God wants them to be. Uh, we also, on in occasions where we're working on evangelistic efforts, uh, need to make sure that we're allowing that to be seen among us uh, in the Lord's Church. Uh, local efforts, uh, mission efforts, and so forth, all of this uh, would be helpful. Uh, we understand also that division can hinder spiritual growth. Uh, generally, there are those who sometimes uh, don't, was not maybe bothered when it seemed like that uh, there's some uh, individuals that's not being maybe used as much as they should or whatever based on um, the intellectual uh, attainments, uh, educational levels or color, whatever, uh, all this kind of thing can cause, if they feel that this is a problem with those who are in leadership and so forth, sometimes it can hinder our evangelistic efforts uh, to get them involved in trying to do and then individuals in the community uh, may feel like, well, you know, they're supposed to be Christians and, and uh, that, uh, that can hinder their spiritual growth. Uh, there have been individuals who have seen some, what they may be perceived to be, uh, someone being treated unjustly and they cause them to, to uh, maybe change congregations or whatever, to, to back off from being as faithful as they should because they perceive that there is a division and uh, there's been occasions where uh, individuals have even questioned why don't brother so-and-so do this or that, allow him to do this or that. And sometimes I said, well, sometimes the leadership knows <laughs> members may be better than the average member. And I said, this, you know, some brother so-and-so has some problems and I'm not going to get up and talk about them because we're trying to work on them, but I'm not going to, you know, encourage him or uh, allow him to be up doing some things uh, because there's some things, you know, that's, that's, needs, that's lacking in, in his uh, way he lives his life and so forth. If members can get bothered by that, then you certainly know they can get bothered if they feel like, well, well why not this? Why not this person? Why don't we do this or that? And sometimes if we're showing division, uh, then it can cause uh, some members to maybe fall away or begin to feel like that uh, uh, maybe we're not handling things the way the Lord wants us to. It can lower our, our compassion for one another if we're divided, uh, feel that we are divided. We ought to care about uh, Christians and, and people, no matter what race they are in the church and out. We ought to have sympathy and compassion. And if, we, if, in, the, if in the society we feel like we're divided, 
uh, then I'm not going to have as much compassion for that person because they're uh, Spanish or they're, uh, they're Caucasian or whatever. Or on the other hand, uh, they're, you know, they are Afro-American and so forth, so we don't have to be as concerned about their needs. Uh, if there's a much division, it can hinder our compassion of reaching across racial lines and treating people the way they should. Uh, and we, all of us, um, understand from just reading Matthew 25 that God expects Christians, if there are needs, to, to minister to them and so forth. So we have to watch out for division. It can cause us not to interact the way we should and as much as we should. And often I've had individuals who um, will say, you're supposed to be a Christian, you know, and especially if they're, you know, trying to get you to give them some money and you, and you want to feed them and they want you to... <laughs> Just hand them the funds. I thought she was a Christian. And it, it amazes me how those outside of Christ can find the faults that they see are perceived to be there among those that are Christians. And uh, I've had one say, well, why come you don't have more white members, you know? And I, I almost asked him, do you believe in busing? <laughs> uh, we, you know, the Bible doesn't teach us, you know, we got to try to, you know, you need a certain number of enough different race to prove that you're a Christian. That's not, you know, that's really not uh, what the Bible teaches. Uh, the door should be open for everybody. And I think a person, if they choose to worship with a predominantly white or predominantly black congregation, they ought to have that option to do so. Um, and sometimes uh, some seem to think, I've had individuals say to me, you know, you need to make a big effort uh, and so forth. And uh, so I have to be cautious if we're showing division then we're not going to look at things uh, the way we ought to look at them. And so we have to be careful. It does hurt. It hurts in the short run, and it hurts in the long run. Uh, so we need to make sure we're showing people we're not divided, that everybody's welcome, and we're going to treat each other the way we want to be treated. The, the Apostle Paul said this to the arrogant Greeks. God made out of one, speaking of Adam, of course, all men to dwell on the face of the earth. And so... We are all related to Adam and Eve, and uh, physically we are related. And of course, bring that on 1,500 years this way, and we're all related through Noah. And so we are all of the same human race, and God created us all in his image. And when we recognize that, um, I think that will help uh, to bring about unity. And that unity is healing. Um, the great hurt in this land and throughout the world can only be healed by the great physician. And of course, in Ephesians 2, he is the one, Jesus Christ is the one who broke down the middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. But that's not the only wall he broke down. He broke down the middle wall of separation between all ethnicities. Um, and we all can be one in Christ Jesus. Um, it's interesting to me that in this great epistle to the church and about the church, the book of Ephesians, there is so much emphasis on the oneness that we can have in Jesus, um, what Jesus sacrificed to make that possible. And it's also uh, the great letter that put so much emphasis on the beauty of the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, um, Paul encourages us to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Um, but he talks about four attitudes or dispositions just prior to that in chapter 4 verse 2, where he says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. When we um, treat every man or woman with those attitudes, um, it's going to help uh, heal conflicts. Uh, that's what unity does. It brings people together. It's also interesting to me that after he makes that appeal, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, he then follows that up with seven uh, doctrinal positions and the very first one is there is one body and as Christians we are all a part of that one body and when we demonstrate that to the world then we are the light of the world then we are the salt of the earth 
when the world sees genuine Christian love in us. Um, genuine Christian love is both appealing and persuasive. Um, when we are truly treating others as, as Christ would treat them, loving others as Christ would love them, the world, the world will see that. And um, unless they want to continue following the devil, they can't help but to be impressed um, by that genuine love. I don't believe there will ever be complete unity and peace in, in the world. Um, the devil's not going anywhere until the Lord comes back, and he doesn't want there to be unity. Um, outside of the body of Christ, he is going to be working to wreck, uh, to wreck any, any kind of peace. He wants human beings to be at, at odds with each other. He wants us to fight with each other. There are too many people that are elitists, that despise, you know, others, that hate others. Um, there are too many people that make money off keeping people at odds with e each other. But there can be unity in the church, and that's what we are to demonstrate. And when we, when we do that, then we can help to heal the world by bringing others uh, to Jesus. It's in the church and to the church that Paul writes in Ephesus and says, we are made alive together, we are framed together, we are built together, we are knit together, that emphasis on unity over and over and over again. And I'm just so thankful that, that you and I share that unity in Jesus and that we share that, that love for each other and respect for each other and friendship and and I'm, again, very thankful uh, to be asked to be here and, and participate in this with you, Brother Taylor. All right, thank you for those uh, presentations. I thank you so much for taking the time and making the preparation. Uh, let me uh, just uh, ask a, a question and then ask uh, each of you to do something as we close out. Uh, each of you... Uh, mentioned that you have person of a different ethnic group that is a part of or came to the congregation. My, I wonder if that when we first see people that what we more so see is that, is that ethnicity. They're always going to be that ethnicity. If they're Haitian, they're going to be Asian. If it's African American, they're going to be African American. If they're Caucasian, they're always going to be Caucasian. But I think as we grow that uh, that something happens or what should happen is moving beyond just seeing their ethnicity and seeing them as one in Christ. There were Jewish Christians, there were Gentile Christians. They didn't stop being Gentile, they didn't stop being Jews, but they were Christians. So uh, just, just uh, very shortly, if you would, uh, Brother Taylor, uh, what helped you see those people that came to your congregation of a eth different ethnic group? What helped you to stop seeing, stopping at the ethnicity and see them as people in Christ? Point back to the way I was raised really helped me uh, seeing people differently. I suppose because of my mother's teaching that you ought to treat everybody right <clears throat> and not put labels on people, that has helped me tremendously uh, all my life. I, uh, even in this town where I live, I was the first um, black person to run a cash register in a, in a, in a, in a store, in a grocery store. Um, I was not, not uncomfortable around people of different races and ethnicities because it was really drilled into me by my mother. But my understanding that we're trying to be like Christ uh, is what really helps uh, the fact that he took men, one was a tax collector, some was fisherman, all of those, and he uh, molded them into a, a group because they still had their little squabbles and on and off, but seeing how he dealt with things and also uh, seeing the ugliness of uh, situations where they looked down on the Samaritans and so forth uh, and realized that every individual, they really are the same underneath. We want to be appreciated. We, it hurts when we're mistreated. I want to be treated kindly. I want to be respected. 
uh, and so forth and have uh, want sympathy when we need it, all of these things. Every human being, uh, I've learned that growing up, but I also learned it even more uh, after I got educated to some extent, understanding that human natures are generally the same. And uh, that sometimes the resistance seeming to get close to you has to do with just mentally making the change and, and uh, so forth. Um, people, everybody can respond to Christ. And that lets me know that he is the answer and that all of us, you know, need him no matter how much money you have, what color you are, uh, so forth, what your uh, physical makeup is. Uh, none of that matters. And I had a, a, a mother who really drilled that into us. I mean, and she lived it. I've seen her do some things that let us know she looked at people equally. And uh, Brother Smith, uh, what helped you to see more than just the ethnicity of the person? I really appreciated your answer, and mine is similar. I was just never taught to see it. My mom and dad uh, never uh, taught me to see it. And Dad was a missionary and a preacher in the Deep South in the 70s. Um, and I don't remember ever attending a church as a young man, as a child, where, that was not integrated. Um, um, I do remember being at different churches where it was opposed and maybe he was fired because, or he just left because he wasn't going to tolerate that kind of thing. Uh, but Mom and Dad just always loved people um and they taught me to 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 not see a difference and to love people and um i guess even even when we think about the prejudices that we see in in the bible um those are prejudices that generally were taught people were taught to feel the jews were taught to feel the way that they felt about the gentiles and jesus came to reshape their thinking and so I have the blessing of, uh, of being um, brought up by parents who wanted me to think like Jesus. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to them for that. All right, so what I'm hearing is certainly let this mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus regarding uh, other people. And of course, unlike uh, undoubtedly the, the fellowship over time, uh, <laughs> Uh, presents an opportunity, and certainly uh, if there are things that happen or differences, like with the funeral, is uh, getting more information and being able to respond accordingly. Thank you. Okay, one final request I want to have of you, you know, just very briefly. One of the, the goals of this particular session is to help us to understand as the Lord's Church that we have a great opportunity in the midst of times like this to shine for Jesus Christ. So I'd like for each of you to take a minute and a half or so and just admonish us, admonish your constituents as well in that particular vein as far as how this is a great opportunity for us to shine for Christ. Brother Taylor. I do believe it is an opportunity for the church to shine and stand out as being different from the world. I see sometime individuals we had an experience there at front street where a mixed couple um, caucasian man is married to an afro-american lady and she was a member of the church he was not and uh, they attended he tended with her uh, everybody you know welcomed them and it's been said that usually congregation take on some of the attitude of the preacher so everybody they you know they kind of made it their business to let them know we, we loved them and appreciated them and so forth uh, some had a little problem at first because uh, they was coming on, on a motorcycle to service. <laughs> and, uh, and the uh, gentleman, he, he wore a ponytail. And so some was kind of, you know, I told him, I said, listen, don't, don't, don't bother him. <laughs> uh, well, the story went this way. Had an old vehicle. He said, I want to buy it. Will you sell it? And I buy it for my, for my daughter. I'll fix it up. He did. And a couple of months later, she wrecked it and killed herself. So I was a little nervous about talking with him, and he was nervous about talking talk to him. So we, we, we talked a little bit, and then when they had a funeral, I went to the funeral. And of course, it was all the motorcycle guys were there, Caucasians, but you know, didn't have a problem. Uh, they couldn't have too much of a problem because his wife was Afro-American. <laughs> and after that, he told me, he said, somehow I feel close to you now. And um, about a month later, he came forward and was baptized. 
Um, at this point, you know, he doesn't wear the leather jackets. He put on a suit coat. He's cut his ponytail short. And I don't, don't bother him. Just, you know, if he's really love the Lord and afraid he's going to cause somebody to stumble, you know, it'll, it'll work its way out. And so now he's kind of fitting in. Uh, uh, everybody's not looking at him so funny because he don't wear his leather jacket and so forth and, and so forth. And he, and he pays attention. And uh, I, to me, I wish the world could, could get, in, get a hold of that kind of thing. Uh, not trying to push people into stuff, but you live it, show it, and we need to, we've got to do this because uh, there are people who are looking at Christianity and trying to decide, I want to be a part of this kind of thing or not. They need to see that the difference it really does make, uh, and we, we've got we've to take advantage of this because there are folks who are exaggerating how far apart we are, how much difference, and sometimes they, it's real exaggeration. And I hope that we'll take advantage of this to let people see we we are really trying to let Christ live in us, and it does make a difference. Christ does, not politics. Brother Smith. Yes, conflict is always going to be a part of our lives, and um, the ability to have a conversation, the ability to talk to each other, and even about difficult things, about things where we disagree. Um, we are able to better do that the more that we spend time with each other, the more that we fellowship with each other, the more that we work together, and the more that we uh, try to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And when we do that, it's going to enable us to tackle tough subjects. Uh, even if we're wrong, we'll be able to speak openly with each other. Uh, and that's how we learn. We can be... Um, I can be corrected if I'm, I'm thinking incorrectly about something. And, and in doing that, we can, we can draw closer to each other. And I just hope that um, um, we will all strive to uh, do better, to, to, to make an effort in that area going forward. Let's communicate. Let's talk. Let's fellowship. Let's spend time together. Thank you, brethren. Let us say a brief word of prayer. Gracious Lord, our God in heaven, help us that we may not engage in the hurt that division causes. Bless us that we might engage in the healing that unity brings. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We need your help.